joining us for Better Habitat Blocks for Understanding Forest Integrity. My name is Lincoln Frasca. I am a conservation planning specialist and, and jumping in on the second half of this presentation will be Jens Hilke, a conservation planner. All right, just some notes about Microsoft Teams and how we use that for these webinars. Uh, you should have a video and a mic option. Um, please keep your mics muted and you can keep your videos on, but if you're having bandwidth issues, it's getting glitchy, shut the video off. That could help with that. Um, there also is a chat function that we use. So you can put your name and your town or uh, organization if you're on a, a board commission or select board you can tell us uh, where you're coming from and you can load that in the chat now and also you could put your uh, questions or comments that come up as we're presenting into the chat and then we're going to have breaks throughout the presentation and we'll take those questions out of the chat and if there's any time left at the end we'll do some live questions Okay, so here's our agenda for the morning. I'm gonna kick us off and talk about what a habitat block really is and how we uh, we use that in the Vermont conservation design. Then Jens is gonna come in and describe some of the, the main threats to our forests and uh, talk about the exciting new habitat blocks data set that's coming out and finish it off with some Vermont case study town examples. All right, just to round out the introductions here, we are the Fish and Wildlife Department, and our mission is the conservation of our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all the people of Vermont. And that mission means that we can serve at many different scales. We work um, with the conservation of all living things from the, the tiny invertebrates all the way up to entire natural communities and whole systems and the interactions between all wildlife and their habitats. And we serve, we serve everybody. Um, we work with private landowners, we work with wildlife enthusiasts, recreationists, passive recreationists, active recreationists, um, and we also work with entire communities to help them uh, plan for their natural resources. And we have a big emphasis on future generations. We want the, the valued resources that we use here in Vermont today to be around for our children and their grandchildren. Now, specifically, Jens and I make up the Community Wildlife Program, which is part of Fish and Wildlife. And what we do is a lot of direct technical assistance to municipalities statewide. We work with a lot of conservation commissions, planning commissions, regional planning commissions, do tons of night meetings, a lot of these webinars, outreach, and we try to help towns understand um, their ecological context and understand the science behind uh, some of what we're going to introduce to you all today with uh, the Vermont Conservation Design and BioFinder. And if you do need help or your town, your town is interested in some of the ideas that we are uh, talking about today, please reach out to Jens and I. And that is, that is our job to, uh, to help your towns uh, do some land use planning and support con conservation. So without any further ado, I will begin by talking about forests. Um, and I'm going to think first about forests on the, the whole systems perspective and all the benefits that they provide to us from just being beautiful places to walk through, as well as sources of, of economic income and uh, really vital, providing vital ecosystem services. So it's not just forests that we're looking at today, it's, it's large forests. And these large forests provide us with large benefits and Many Vermonters really have value the, the benefits that we, we get from these forests. Um, and these are some of the top reasons why. There's uh, bigger forests give us greater biological diversity. Okay, more space allows for more different habitats to exist. Uh, the scenery of the forest is the backdrop to the Green Mountain State. And uh, there is there's something inspiring about looking over a, a forest vista and uh, these forests also hold intrinsic value and they're valuable in their in their own rights. We get clean air and water from forests through carbon sequestration and water filtration. 
and the roots of the trees. And these these forests provide these working landscapes for for forest industries such as logging or sugar mapling and Christmas tree farming. Um, recreation and tourism also brings in a lot of money each year to Vermont and uh, is is sort of the the Vermont brand is is a lot of you know coming to our state and recreating uh, and our rural character and the outdoor opportunities that we have here. Uh, large forests provide uh, the benefit of erosion prevention and they reduced flooding by you know holding the landscape together with that root system and letting uh, water soak up into into the soil and not run straight across it. Okay, hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing are all benefits of larger forests, and all these activities are frankly more fun when in a bigger forest, and they connect people to the, this landscape and are a, a cultural pastime for, for a lot of Vermont families. We get less ticks in larger forests as well. Uh, one of our colleagues told us that they came upon, you know, several ticks just the other day in Richmond. So they're out already and uh, they're getting worse and worse. And uh, we, we see less of them in the deep dark woods than we do on these edge habitats. Um, so, so, you know, in, in conclusion here, we get this overall climate health from, for, from large forests. And uh, we, we see these ecosystem services provided and this idea of climate resiliency when we're thinking about dealing with climate change. Now, I'll, I'll just kind of focus in here on this next slide is going to be how our forests um, really power our economy here in Vermont. And these are just some, some big numbers to kind of highlight that. Uh, the forest-based recreation and tourism is about almost two billion to Vermont's economy annually. And our forest products are another one and a half billion. And that makes up for 12% of Vermont's gross domestic product and it includes and that provides about 20,000 full-time jobs. The fall leaf peepers are 25% of our tourists and that income looks like a $460 million a year. Hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing all contributes another 685 million to Vermont's economy. And that's second annually in the nation only to Alaska. And then there's, um, there's avoided costs and maintaining intact wetlands can help prevent a lot of damage during major flooding events. We saw that in um, Middlebury where they saved 2 million damages during hurricane, 2 million in damages uh, during Hurricane Irene because the Otter Creek had access to, to its historic floodplains and it was allowed to flow into them versus, um, you know, picking up more and more speed and, and doing damage it, uh, to development in, in floodplains. So, so, you know, we need to be thinking about our forests value on many different levels. And this, this economy one it is a big driver for us here in Vermont. And there's this huge range of benefits for larger forests. And that's why it's, it's really important that we understand where these forests are located throughout the state. And that brings us to uh, forest and habitat blocks. So the Fish and Wildlife Department put together this forest and habitat blocks data set, um, primarily of forests, but it also includes rivers and streams, lakes and ponds and all natural communities. And the forests included in these blocks can, they really vary greatly. And there might be some, there are definitely early secessional stands. There are also actively managed forests and mature forests that have had no or, or very little recent human disturbance. And the, the main defining factor of these habitat blocks is that there's no permanent fragmentation from there's uh, little or no permanent fragmentation from roads or agricultural lands and other forms of development within these habitat blocks that we've identified. So these blocks are areas of natural cover surrounded by roads, development, and agriculture on the, on the boundary of them. They are unfragmented within the blocks. And in total, we have 4,055 habitat blocks in Vermont that are larger than 20 acres. And the largest one is, is around 153,000 acres. And the average blocks are about 1,000 acres. 
So we can see on this state map here that we have the uh, you know, largest forests are represented by the darker colors and they go up the spine of the Green Mountains and in the Northeast Kingdom. And that's a you know major trend for our state. And then we have smaller blocks here down in the in the valleys, okay, and other other mid-sized blocks interspersed throughout. Bigger blocks generally do mean bigger benefits and, and better for habitat. But we know that some of these smaller blocks at lower elevations, say by you know, Lake Champlain in the Champlain Valley, uh, also are some of the more biodiverse places in Vermont because lower elevations are not as harsh as higher altitudes um, that we find up here in the in the spine of the Green Mountains. So understanding both of those truths is important as we as we move forward here. Bigger is better, and the smaller spots are sometimes smaller blocks can be hot spots for ecological diversity. Now let's talk about how we how we got here. How did we actually physically create these blocks? Okay, so we started with the natural cover data, um, and that was forest, shrubs, water, you know, anything natural. We looked at that data set. And then we removed fragmenting features that were um, that were in there, like roads, railroads, and erased a minimum density of, of buildings. And what that left us with was uh, these forest blocks of 20 acres or more that were uninterrupted by roads, agriculture, or other structures. And these blocks, as we, as we saw in the previous slide, they vary greatly in size, but they also um, are very different physical landscapes depending on their location. And they provide a huge range of different habitats for all different wildlife across all of the blocks. And it's worth understanding the factors at play there. So let's look at a couple, um, two, two different, two very different habitat blocks. So here is an example um, from a forest block in Ferrisburg, Vermont. And this is where the Otter Creek joins in with Lake Champlain and forms a unique floodplain forest natural community. And this area is full, full of life. It plays a critical role in providing habitat for just a huge range of wildlife. I mean, the birds that you find along the Otter Creek, there's a huge list. Um, rails, pied-billed grebes, common moorhens, bitterns, herons, and we get the fur-bearing species, beaver, minks, muskrats. We have all kinds of amphibians and reptiles, salamanders, newts, frogs, painted turtles. I mean, you name it, but all these animals call the Otter Creek their home. And this, this specific block is, is really an ecological hotspot. Um, these species all have very different habitat needs, but they're able to thrive in this same location. So because of you know, climate factors and uh, landscape position and the bedrock, all these different factors lead to this area being really rich in biodiversity. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a very different block in the Worcester Range. And uh, this, this block um, makes up the C.C. Putnam State Forest along the Worcester Mountain Range. It's a, 45,000 acre block, mostly northern hardwoods with montane spruce fir in higher elevations. And there are definitely fewer fewer number of species here than we saw on the outlet of the Otter Creek. But what we have here are the larger ranging mammals, bear, moose, bobcats, white-tailed deer. Um, and, and the value of this block is really in its regionally significant placement. So you can see to the east, we have a 29,000 acre block that provides connectivity across Route 12 here and goes up into Elmore. And then to the west, we have a 56,000 acre block um, that makes up Mansfield State Forest. So, you know, uh, some quick math tells you that these blocks combined, you're, you know, well over 100 acres um, if you can keep them connected, which in this case they, they are. Um, and, oh, sorry about that. So, you know, our larger ranging mammals need this type of connected habitat for genetic exchange across regions and going up into Canada and Maine. And conservation 
in areas like these is really an ongoing effort and it takes multiple partners working at multiple different scales. And this particular linkage is critical in the Staying Connected initiative, which is a bi-national partnership that maintains networks of wildlife connectivity across the Northern Appalachian Acadian region. And actually uh, exciting news on Route 12 is that in uh, 2025, VTrans is going to be putting in four different road structures, replacing four different structures and making them larger. And uh, they're going to be able to facilitate and they're thinking about wildlife movement. It'll be easier for wildlife to get across these culverts or bridges. And Jens is going to add a story map into the chat that we recently finished um, that highlights this project and the Staying Connected initiative. OK, so. These these blocks that we've been looking at in different different scales and different areas are really a unit for conservation science. Um, the 2014 habit, habitat blocks are the raw data and every block in larger than 20 acres in Vermont is included in this in this raw data set. But then we have the Vermont conservation design, which consists of interior forest and connectivity blocks that are, that are a subset of those 4,000 block totals. Okay, so in 2016, 263 of, of these total blocks were selected as highest priority interior forests to be part of the Vermont Conservation Design, or VCD. 433 were selected as highest priority connectivity blocks, and other blocks were also included for their physical landscape diversity. They were unique. Maybe it was a you know, a talus cliff or um, just some topography that that was very different um, or different elevation changes that were unique and those landscapes were diverse and important. So some of these blocks are both interior and and uh, interior forest and connectivity priorities, and some are just one or the other. But these highest priority blocks are all essential for maintaining ecological function now and into the future. And we really need to be incorporating them uh, when we're planning at the town level. Okay, so also in 2016 was the Act 171 Forest Integrity Law. Um, this was passed to ensure Vermont towns are managing their forests in a way that maintains and improves forest health and habitat connectors. And it requires towns to identify and manage for these highest priority forest blocks and habitat connectors. So it also requires towns to plan for development in these areas in a way that minimizes fragmentation. And planning like planning tools like zoning and subdivision and natural resource overlays can all help really get at this goal. The Vermont Conservation Design highest priority blocks are a great starting place for planning um, because they're already prioritized from a statewide perspective. Although I will say that in order to identify and plan for local priorities, more work is needed. You can't just be looking at the Vermont conservation design and know exactly what planning tool is going to work in your town. We need further natural community inventories uh, that might be a community effort or, or a hired professional consultant like Arrowwood Environmental, for instance. Um, the this kind of data, you know, finer scale data will help your town get much more detailed understandings of the natural resources and where your ecological hotspots might be present. All right, so we'll use Heinsberg as our example here. Um, and we see on the screen we have the Vermont conservation design, highest priority interior connectivity, interior um, connectivity and physical landscape blocks. So this is, um, you know, this is a great start for Heinsberg, but it misses some very important local features. So the town made a, um, a map overlay of core habitat areas and wildlife connectors, local wildlife connectors. So they, they took the, um, the VCD map and then they overlaid their own map of these known local wildlife connectors that weren't showing up on a 20 acre filter that we use on the state level. 
And identifying and mapping these local forest and wildlife corridors is an opportunity for your town to, to build upon the data that's presented in the VCD and also an opportunity to celebrate the place and the resources that you, that you live around um, while you're doing it and involve your community as well. So it's the it's the marriage between both of these processes, some of some boots on the ground inventorying and local knowledge mixed with the statewide pr priorities to understand your, you know, regional placement and significant to get at um, some real some real information that can inform land use planning. All right, so this graph here shows the basic idea behind town planning for natural resources when we're looking at habitat block size. And at the top, you can see the block size with bigger blocks of habitat to the left and the smaller blocks to the right. And the rows are list of species that the block size, that block size is likely to support. And we can see, you know, all the way on the left is an undeveloped forest. And then we move all the way to the right, which is a one to 20 acre forest. That's an isolated urban forest block. And there's really an undeniable pattern here um, of the bigger habitat blocks equaling more species diversity. If all things are created equally, like we said, we have these ecological hotspots in smaller blocks at lower elevations. Think of that lower Otter Creek blot and wetland areas. Um, but this trend, this overall trend of the benefits of unfragmented and connected forests is a really good starting point when we're planning for habitat connectivity. Just understanding this fundamental idea is, is essential when we're thinking about um, planning on the town level and connecting our green spaces and making it across, uh, across roads and potential barriers. So going to finish up my section here with a uh, with a little movement pattern and we're going to talk about how connectivity happens across the landscape when wildlife need to move from a core forest block to another core forest block that aren't directly connected so the way that this the way that this works is with smaller stepping stones and connecting lands okay so to get from a to b you know you have to go through this connecting land um, it might not be there critical habitat area, but they're going to have to pass through it. And how are they going to get across the road to do that? They're going to need wildlife road crossings, these areas where forest touches the road on either side. These are the areas in between the stepping stones and the core forest blocks that um, we, we, can, we know and we've been able to map that wildlife crossing needs to happen here. And also, they're going to be using stream size connectors uh, that those the vegetation that follows the stream bank or the riparian area we know are important areas for for wildlife to be moving um, and connecting their habitat. So, um, you know, we this this type of connectivity allows for gene flow between species and um, keeps keeps species able to be able to move and adapt when we're thinking about climate change um, and changes land use changes so we don't get this pattern by accident uh, we need to be using the best available science and long-term planning strategies to make this these connections and make sure that they are maintained for you know now and to the future so we don't lose the connectivity that we have and we can hopefully restore some connectivity that we've lost. And I'm gonna pause my section here. I'll take uh, any questions that are coming in the chat at this point and then I'll bounce it over to you, Jens. Uh, thanks, Lincoln. Um, Tim was asking, uh, are these forest blocks shown in the current version of BioFinder? Yes, yeah, the the biofinder is the mapping tool in which we look at Vermont conservation design, which is that subset of the raw data of all Vermont's habitat blocks. So you have all the habitat blocks, you have those highest priority ones in the VCD, and then you have biofinder, which is the online mapping tool where we can look at the VCD blocks. And and Tim, just to put a finer point on that, uh, when you open BioFinder, you see the prioritization theme, the, the VCD. If you switch in the top left, if you switch the theme to inventory and then open the forest pattern map, map number three, that's how you see all the forest blocks in Vermont. Um, okay, uh, Lincoln, are legislators seeing this kind of presentation? 
As a matter of fact, they are. Yeah, Jens testified not too long ago to um, to the House about Vermont conservation design and how we're using this work um, to to do land use planning. So it is something that we work on uh, doing a lot of outreach with and think about how we message this to different groups and um, the legislators are are part of that. And uh, John uh, was looking for a clean copy of the wildlife forest block size table with the species. Um, and John, just so you know, I, I do have a clean copy for you that came from the book Above and Beyond, Visualizing Change in the Vermont Landscape. Uh, and I have a pretty good quality scan of that one. So just email me separately. Um, that's all we've got for questions in the chat at this time. Um, I'm going to share my screen and, and take over here. But uh, yes. folks, please do keep the questions coming. We will um, we'll stop several times uh, to, uh, to answer questions as we move forward. Um, Lincoln, are you seeing my screen OK? Yep, you're all good. All right, great. So thanks so much. Um, so Lincoln started by explaining well, what is a habitat block and then went into thinking about the habitat block as a unit for land use planning. Now I want to look at some of the threats uh, to our uh, to our forests and then I'll introduce the new uh, 2023 habitat blocks. So let's just begin with a little history. Our, our forests have changed significantly over time. Before white settlers arrived, Vermont was something like 97% forest. And I mean, that must have been really incredible. Just these huge continuous forest blocks with occasional openings for a beaver wetland or uh, the, the odd uh, lightning strike. But by the late 1800s, we dropped to about 20% forest. We literally clear cut the vast majority of Vermont. And as a consequence, we lost all manner of our wildlife species. Since the late 1800s, the amount of forest has come back to plateau around 80% tree cover. And in some ways, that's the most successful ecological restoration of all time. Just think about that. It's really incredible what's happened here over these last few hundred years. And I'll go as far as to say it's an experiment and we don't really know where it's headed because the natural communities that have come back since Vermont was clear cut are actually different than what was here before. The tree composition has changed. There's significantly less American beach on the landscape, for example, than there was. And we know that this change is going to continue into the future. But in the last 15 to 20 years, we're again losing forest cover. Uh, we were at about 78% in 2005, and we're roughly 76% today. It sort of depends um, how you, you categorize it as actual forest cover or tree cover. But really what we're doing is we're losing this forest uh, to sprawl development. So sprawl development, it can happen in the, the more urban uh, environments outside of Burlington, uh, but it, it really does happen in, in the rural countryside as well. We call that ex-urban sprawl. So sprawl is dispersed, auto-dependent development outside of compact urban and village centers. And this is the landscape pattern that Vermont has really embraced since World War II. And that landscape pattern is having impacts on our way of life and the, the quantity and quality of the ecological benefits that we receive from our landscape. So in many ways, sprawl is the Vermont brand. That's that rural, rugged, independent lifestyle. That's what we're selling to, to folks, encouraging them, them to come here. And yet that sprawl development then has an impact on the very character of, of our place. So um, many of you have seen this graphic several times before, but this is a these are a couple photos from what we call the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Road Crossing. And so you can see Route 100 uh, there in the uh, at left, um, and uh, that's the junction with Moscow Road. Uh, and so at left is the aerial photo from 1962, and is at right is the same photo from 2011. And I've colored what I consider to be forest in green. 
So there's actually no change in forest cover between these two photos. Uh, even though we were in this period of reforestation since the late 1800s, but we, because we, we've had a lot of old fields come back into forest. But at the same time as some of that reforestation is happening, you can also see a lot of clearing. And so this block is no longer connected north to south. You can see all the development that's come in there. And, and mind you, this is beautiful. And there's a veneer of trees along the roads that you, you can't tell how many houses are, are tucked back in here. But the pattern is of degraded wide habitat quality. So it remains to be seen if this block is still connected east to west. Uh, we call it one of the most important pinch points in Vermont. So there hasn't been an appreciable change in, in the amount of forest on this slide, but what there has been is a huge change in the pattern. It's no longer as connected as it was. And so the more connect, disconnected uh, you know, our forest blocks become, they become islands in a sea of development and their ecological impacts there. Um, according to the Forest Service, there's an average net loss of about 11,000 acres of Vermont forest each year. So we convert a lot, but then some of it reverts back to forest. Uh, so, you know, 11,000 acres uh, per year. Um, this is a look at just forest pattern in Heartland, Vermont. And forest is colored in black and white uh, is the non-forest, um, as well as development and agriculture. So just seeing the size and the distribution of those forest blocks around town tells us it lacks a lot of deep forest. There's been a small amount of development spread along these rural roads with lots of open land. It is beautiful, but small blocks of forest don't lead to the same levels of biological diversity that intact forests do. So this is great habitat for deer to grow up, but it's not a great place for a larger suite of deep forest species, and it offers less biological diversity. So this pattern creates a problem for us. And I mean, in many ways, you can think of Heartland as the, the, the quintessential Vermont landscape. You know, it's beautiful mix of farms and forests, and yet the pattern of the forest is really small. And so that this pattern creates a problem. When we add in the pressure of climate change and the need for species to move and adjust their range, well, that, that makes for an even bigger challenge here. Um, you know, the Vermont climate is getting warmer and wetter, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. And, you know, by, by 2070, Vermont uh, is gonna feel more like Georgia and Alabama. This is under two different emission scenario, a high emission scenario on red and a low emission scenario in orange. But this is 2007 global CO2 emissions and actual CO2 emissions have really are much, much higher now than that high emission scenario. So at its most basic, I, I mentioned warmer and wetter, but that doesn't really get at the nuance here because that those changes from climate change are not evenly distributed across the landscape or over time. So we have, we'll have short-term droughts and more and more precipitation coming in big storm events. Uh, the impact of climate is also felt disproportionately among the population. BIPOC Vermonters, frontline communities are disproportionately affected. And so these changes associated with climate are going to be felt more by some Vermonters than from others, and more at some parts of points in time than in others. We're also seeing an increase in the number of people moving here, whether it's uh, COVID migration or climate migration, we are seeing changes. Uh, this graph shows the increase in the number of out-of-state buyers of residential property sales between uh, 2020 and 2021. And uh, that's an increase of over 1,000 residential property sales. So the out-of-state part isn't the problem. It's not necessarily bad. I'm just saying that there's a huge spike in demand for property in Vermont. And so that's further exacerbating this problem of sprawl development. I talked about that Vermont brand that we're advertising with that's attracting people to come here and live that rural lifestyle. 
and yet it's that that it, it, that rural lifestyle in an uncontrolled development pattern results in sprawl and forced fragmentation. Development in Vermont is happening in low densities and mostly in rural areas. Regrettably, it, it is not happening in existing town centers or in planned growth areas. It's overwhelmingly in our agricultural and rural residential districts, where, where that's where most of the growth is happening. And it's slow, but consistent. I think of it as one house at a time sort of development uh, by and large. Very little of the development that happens in Vermont actually triggers Act 250. Only about 2% of the subdivisions are, are triggering Act 250. So the vast majority of this development is only regulated at the town level. In the diagram at left, you can see a statewide drop in acreage that are held in larger parcels and an increase in acreage held in smaller parcels. That's fine and even good if it happens in the village center. But when that's happening in our ag and rural residential districts, that is sprawl development. Okay, so that was a little bit about some of the threats we're seeing to our habitat blocks. Lincoln, any questions for me at this time? Um, there is a question about Act 171 language. Uh, Act 171 refers to forest blocks and habitat connectors, but could you comment on the use of forest blocks um, or habitat blocks instead of uh, forest blocks and which is best to use? Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I flip back and forth on that language. We created the term habitat block because from an ecological standpoint, as Lincoln said, it includes things that technically aren't forest, wetlands, shrublands, water. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, essentially these are, are, are overwhelmingly forest blocks. So I, I think, you know, forest blocks from a town plan perspective is probably a better term because it's more easily understood by your readers. Um, the, the term habitat connector was really invented as part of, of Act 171. And that was really Governor Shumlin's language at the time. Um, and so, you know, I don't particularly love that, that language, but we're using that to refer to both those stepping stone forest blocks that Lincoln showed as well as wildlife road crossings, and of course the entire streamside network. And can you say something about the importance of hedgerows in the Champlain Valley ag lands? It, yeah, thank you. Um, I I do have, I guess not in this slideshow, but I do have some awesome bobcat telemetry data that shows bobcats using hedgerows uh, right uh, coming out of, of Shelburne Pond. So hedgerows, those are sort of a type of micro connector uh, that, you know, over a short hop of ag land can just be incredibly important. It's not the best connector in the world. Wider is better, but they can be over a short distance. Those hedgerows and tree lines can be incredibly important. Um, many species aren't going to go out into the middle of the field. So those hedgerows are important, and it's actually uh, something that we're better able to map uh, I'll explain that in the in the next section about how our newer habitat blocks are better able to to uh, to get that. Okay, and then um, one more question here: Is this level of fragmentation common across New England states? Well, Tim, we have much much more forest cover than most of New England, other than Maine. Um, so, you know, other states, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, see much more significant forest fragmentation, have seen much more for significant forest fragmentation than we have. Um, I, I, I can't compare to Maine exactly. I don't really know it, you know, from the down east to, to up north uh, are radically different. Um, but there's, uh, you know, in many ways, our forest cover in Vermont is the envy of the northeast. And I'll, I'll let Jim get the question in and then we'll go back to the slideshow. But what is the possibility of former ag land reverting to forests and thus strengthening forests? Um, yeah, so that would be, you know, afforestation, the natural regrowth of forests. And of course, that happens all of the time. There's this concept of the climax state, you know, the climax forest. Uh, where does ecological succession lead? And in Vermont, it almost always leads to forest. 
So yes, if we, uh, and, and that's happened to farmland across Vermont, you know, to go from 20% to 80%, uh, that wasn't just reforestation, that was also afforestation. So I think there's absolutely potential for that. <clears throat> All right, okay, I'm yes. just going to keep going, yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, all right. So now I'd like to talk about the creation of this new Habitat Block data set. So in 2016, the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab produced a series of new, uh, uh, new high-resolution high resolution <laughs> land cover data set uh, that is the basis for our Habitat Blocks revision. So the aerial photo that you see on screen is of Milton, and it includes a mix of forests, wetlands, fields, and roads. So here's the same data showing the tree canopy data set. And so please notice that you can see individual trees out in the fields and next to the river. Also note that it doesn't include wetlands and shrublands. So in building the new habitat block data set, we brought together several different inputs uh, so this tree canopy data is at the heart of it, and it allows for really an unparalleled resolution. In the first segment, Lincoln explained that natural cover was the starting point, and that was used from land cover data, uh, the, the Coastal Change Assessment Program, and that had a 30 meter pixel. Our new, uh, our new land cover data has a 0 0.5 meter pixel. So it's a much finer scale data to get at this natural cover piece. So we're adding water and tree canopy as long as, as well as the, the supplemental wetlands, supplemental shrublands and significant natural communities. So that's this new natural cover piece, uh, similar to, to the methodology that Lincoln explained for the, the 2011 product or 2014. So we also refined the fragmenting features, how we cut those blocks, that area of natural cover, how we cut those into blocks. So we erased from the natural cover, we erased uh, in different areas. So first of all, we were able to use more accurate data, uh, road data that actually shows the width of the road. Uh, we use the impervious surface layer. Uh, as well as buildings. And so we put a buffer around every single building. Uh, Lincoln explained that in the previous product, we used a building density, but here we actually put a buffer on every, every building. <coughs> and then also uh, ski slopes. Uh, we removed, uh, you know, ski slopes were removed uh, from the natural cover to, to create the new habitat blocks. So let's just look at a comparison here. Um, so at right uh, is the new data and at left is the, the old data. And you can really see the, the, the difference in, uh, in the quality of the resolution of this data. Uh, and again, back to uh, that earlier question about, about shrublands, you know, the biggest change that we're seeing here is around the edges um, and uh, of the edges of the block. So here's a zoom in. And, and so I just wanted to point out where you can really see the enhanced resolution. So you notice that how the, the blocks come down to the road, and that's because of that higher resolution being able to show small tree lines. Uh, those are much more better, uh, much more accurately mapped. Um, and, and so we're better able to capture uh, connecting lands uh, than, than we were in the previous product. I, I'm also, uh, you know, I mentioned the building density, and so I'm sure you'll notice all the circles around the buildings. And so that's a way of, of conveying the understanding of, of how sprawl development is impacting our forests. And so you can see some of the degraded quality of the habitat based on that development. Um, and lastly, and you may not be able to pick up on this, but the more accurate road widths and well as more accurate stream widths are, are baked into this final product. All right, so let me just give you a few examples of how this, uh, how this more accurate block mapping can help the town planning process. In 2020 and 2021, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department worked with the Williston Conservation Commission to develop a new set of, of habitat blocks uh, and wildlife road crossings so that they could better prioritize areas for their significant wildlife habitat overlay district. 
So this effort was actually the precursor to the statewide habitat block update that we've been describing. And so the process we used here in Williston was a pilot for how we could do this statewide. And the, the two maps you see on screen uh, at left, the 2014 habitat blocks data set, and at right are these, these new habitat blocks. And so just notice the better accuracy, particularly at the center uh, here with this block and just how uh, the you know, much better resolution, much better ability to discern those, uh, those uh, connecting lands. So once the forest blocks were completed for Williston, this enabled us to better map potential wildlife road crossings at a local scale. Again, grabbing those hedgerows, those tree lines. At right, the colors are the different components of the habitat block, tree canopy in the light green, wetlands uh, in the darker green and shrublands and an orange. And so you can see the grid that was used along the roads. And so we calculated the percent cover of the habitat block on both sides of the road within those rectangles. And where there was good quality cover present on both sides, i.e. in blocks on both sides of the road, we were able to flag potential wildlife road crossings. And again, it's the resolution of the habitat block data that allowed for this sort of road segment analysis. So here's, uh, you know, having completed that habitat mapping uh, this uh, that allowed for the road mapping, and then it allowed us to prioritize these areas into what we call the primary conservation area and a secondary conservation area. And so the tiered approach helps the town bring this work into their planning and regulatory framework. So, uh, so you get a sense of, of how, what that prioritization can look like with the higher priority areas in red, uh, you know, those larger forest blocks, uh, of course, all of the, the wetlands and the, the uh, riparian cover, the streamside uh, vegetation. So here's another example in Waitsfield. Um, and so on screen, you're seeing the, uh, the zoning districts for Waitsfield. Uh, and so where you can see through to the area photo, uh, that's their, uh, their rural residential district. At far right is the forest reserve district. Uh, and then the area in purple is a special flood hazard area uh, associated with the Mad River. And so here's a map of where development has happened in the last five years put together by the town planner. And so the vast majority of development here in Waitsfield has been in that agricultural and residential zone. It's not happening in the Forest Reserve District, good, good news, but it's not happening in the village either. So in 2020, the Planning Commission was working on a housing overlay district, but they wanted to better understand where not to put development. So they, they wanted to accurate maps to understand where their forest cover and where the important habitats were and what you know, was suitable for housing. So the, there was a, a subcommittee formed with members of the Planning Commission and the Conservation Commission. And that's incredible. They worked very well together. It was excellent to get the two commissions together, uh, you know, members from those two commissions into the subcommittee. And they worked with me to, uh, to better map these forest blocks. So uh, the mapping of forest blocks and road crossings was done in the same way as Williston. But here in Waitsfield, we also had excellent field inventory from Arrowwood Environmental. So in green, you can see the new habitat dot block data at left, and it's categorized with green representing core forest, orange as connecting blocks, and light green as a locally significant uh, area, uh, again, coming from that field inventory. So once the habitat blocks were identified, we further created the, the wildlife road crossings that you see at right, and this in turn helped inform where best to put housing. So since the Planning Commission was particularly interested in affordable housing that was close to Route 100, we actually assessed Route 100 crossings differently than the rest of the town. We had to set a slightly lower threshold for, for cover on both sides of the road because Route 100 is busier, there's more development. Um, but we were able to identify specific uh, road segments along Route 100 that helped facilitate wildlife movement. 
So I just wanted to give you a sense of how we can use the science with this better resolution to bring it into the town's planning and, and regulatory framework. <laughs> Excuse me. So please remember that BioFinder is a great resource to see the most up-to-date conservation mapping. It shows the Vermont conservation design, and these are the lands and waters most important to maintain ecological function now and into the future. The new forest canopy and land cover mapping appears in the inventory theme. So at the top left, you can change the theme. And we'll be posting the newest habitat blocks and any changes to Vermont conservation design uh, as soon as they're completed. So by the end of 2023, we'll have the new habitat blocks and the new prioritization of blocks posted here on BioFinder. I uh, wanted to remind you that mapping Vermont's natural heritage explains how to use the data available on BioFinder and apply it to the town planning uh, system. It explains what each of the maps show and how to interpret them, and then it does a deep dive into the strategies and actions uh, to address different conservation goals. It's going to outline both regulatory and non-regulatory strategies. Okay. Uh, Lastly, I just want to remind everyone that overwhelmingly it's uh, hunters and anglers that pay for conservation in Vermont, but everyone can, can play a role in supporting conservation. You can purchase a Vermont habitat stamp. No, it's not an actual postage stamp. It's more like a bumper sticker, but the proceeds do go to the department to buy actual habitat. Uh, and we've had some, some great success there. Um, just as an aside, I was looking for uh, 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 salamanders uh, the other night in a, in a vernal pool near my house and uh, with my boys. And when we came out of the woods, you know, it was the middle of the night, there was another another group there looking for salamanders. And when I came out of the uh, out of the woods, it was really fun to see that both vehicles had habitat stamps on the buffer on the bumper. So really fun. You can also uh, support uh, conservation through a donation to the Non-Game Wildlife Fund uh, as its tax. All right, so with that, we do have a few minutes to answer questions. I'll stop sharing my screen, but Lincoln, um, what can you... Yeah. Thanks, Jens. So are there a few towns in Vermont that stand out as having had the best success in mitigating fragmentation? And what did they do or are they doing to achieve this success? Uh, there are uh, lots of different examples there, uh, and and you, so there's a whole range in very different landscapes. So one that jumps to mind, Enosburg, uh, limited driveway length as a as a uh, anti forest fragmentation strategy. I already mentioned a couple towns, uh, Waitsfield and the Mad River Valley. Uh, the the use of forest districts and conservation districts uh, can be really helpful. Even small changes like tightening up the standards in ag and rural residential districts uh, can be good. So, um, you know, in Bolton, we looked at their uh, forest district and their conservation district and uh, changed uh, the uh, single family homes from a, in the conservation district from an approved use to a conditional use. So those get a little bit more scrutiny in their in their forest and conservation districts. Uh, so there's really a, 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 a number of towns that are are tackling forest fragmentation with different tools. Uh, town of Vernon, excuse uh, uh, Newfane, forgive me, has uh, some great language in the town plan that speaks to forest fragmentation and and kind of makes the case for how forest pattern is uh, is at the heart of of, of conservation efforts. So a lot to say there, but, you know, all, all over the place, I guess. Great. And were any recreation trails or trail networks beyond ski areas considered in the new habitat block mapping? No, we don't uh, consider trails as fragmenting features at this landscape scale. Um, so it's really important to understand the habitat blocks are a landscape scale phenomenon. And so uh, from that standpoint, trails aren't considered a, a, a fragmenting feature. But Meredith, as you well know, the density of trails can really impact the quality of the habitat. And so I'm not saying that trails should be dismissed as a, a potential fragmenter uh, or, or, uh, or degrading the quality of a habitat block, but at the landscape scale, we did not consider those fragmenting features, and so they are not included. 
Okay. And Tim had asked about if there are instructions to follow um, to use the functions of BioFinder. I put the link to Mapping Vermont's Natural Heritage in the chat. Jens, do you want to point folks anywhere else? Yeah, um, we we uh, so we record all of these webinars, and we've done a bunch over the years. One of our first ones was how to use BioFinder, and so that one is less conceptual and more nuts and bolts of how do you actually, where do you click? Click here, there, click, click, click here, click there, and so forth. So that is available as a webinar. Um, Lincoln and I also do those trainings. Uh, probably best done either as an online training or as a uh, in person at a computer lab somewhere. But we will meet with a commission or you know preferably several commissions to do a hands-on training on how to use BioFinder. So feel free to contact us and we can when hook you up with that. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic. All right, no other questions in the chat. Uh, any, any other thoughts out there in the audience? Just a few minutes remaining. All right, folks, it's been uh, such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. Uh, we're, we continue to be available to you, so let us know how we can help in your conservation work. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for coming. Yeah.